Good afternoon, dear guests, dear participants, dear jury members. We are happy to start the Foreign Walls Lab Kazan 2018. Thank you, thank you. The Falling Walls Lab is an interdisciplinary forum for aspiring scientists and professionals from around the world. It is part of the annual internationally renowned conference for breakthroughs in science and society. The Falling Walls Conference, the Falling Walls Lab, offers hundreds of emerging talents, entrepreneurs, and innovators a stage to pitch their research work, initiatives, and business models to their peers a distinguished jury from academia and business and the general public. It is the second time the Falling Walls Lab is here at Kazan Federal University. Exactly one year before, in 2017, we were here and had congratulated our friend Emil Bulata, uh, the winner of the Falling Walls Lab Kazan 2017. He was representing Kazan, our Falling Walls Lab, at Berlin, and now he moved to the jury board. Please welcome him. Uh, and uh, a few words about our rules. Our speakers will have only three minutes and only three slides on PowerPoint for their presentations. If they stop less than three minutes, then our jury could ask questions. But the answer could not exceed the limit of three minutes. After all, presentation jury board will go to special room and debate the final decision and the select the winner. Only one winner and only one general prize ticket to Falling Walls Conference in Berlin. So uh, now it's time to, uh, for me to present our jury board. Uh, Lie Buschkanitz, <laughs> professor, doctor of science. Uh, Institute of International Relations, History and Oriental Studies, Kazan Federal University. Mikhail Vorflameyev, Associate Professor, Candidate of Science. <laughs> Alexander Butler of Institute of Chemistry, Kazan Federal University. Uh, and our guest, uh, of course, we can afford that each and every member of jury uh, is from the Kazan Federal University. Of course, it's not acceptable. So we're happy and we're proud that uh, a few people joined our ju jury board, uh, not from Kazan Federal University. Uh, Dilbar Sultanova, <laughs> professor, doctor of sciences, Kazan National Research Technological, uh, Technological University, the head of department of the innovation in chemical technology. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Madina Sibgatulina, <laughs> candidate of science, scientific secretary of the Institute for, for Problems of Ecology and Mineral Wealth Use, Tatarstan Academy of Science. Madina, thank you very much for uh, joining jury board. And Emil Bulatov, PhD, uh, <laughs> but he's from Kazan Federal University. <laughs> uh, so, and I want to invite our friends from the VH, but uh, this abbreviation is in German language, but uh, our, uh, our language today is English. Uh, he is a coordinator of the German Center for the Research and Innovation. Our friends, uh, they help us a lot, and I think for them that uh, the year before uh, Victor Reimer from Aachen University come, uh, it's a pity that uh, this year nobody could come for us, but um, it's a really, really, really pity. So, please, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mikhail Rusakov. I'm, uh, I'm coordinator of the German uh, Center for Research and Innovation. And uh, first of all, I, I'm very glad, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you uh, in the second uh, Falling Walls Lab uh, at the Kazan Federal University. And first of all, I'd like to uh, thank to the organizers of this event, to the university. It's great that uh, you organized the second one, the second Falling Walls Lab. It means that uh, you will like this format uh, very well. Um, the German Center for Research and Innovation, this, this is an, an organization um, that unites German, German research institutions and uh, German 
scientific foundations in a kind of council, and all together we. Uh, it's like an umbrella organization for German, uh, for German organizations that are represented in Russia. And all together we present uh, a German science and German technologies uh, here in Russia, in different, in different cities. Um, Falling Balls Lab is a very interesting uh, format that allows young people, uh, young ambitious people like you, uh, to present your their ideas and uh, uh, and uh, projects, how to make our life better. And I'm looking forward to your presentations and to your ideas. It's um, um, and I wish you uh, good luck with you uh, with uh, uh, with your projects. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Thank you for coming and for help. Uh, well. Let's start the presentation, and it's my pleasure to invite here Arsentieva Yulia with her falling wall, the breaking the wall of e-platforms, please. Dear guests, dear participants, so thank you very much for such an opportunity to participate in this breaking the walls. So, the topic of my uh, research is breaking the walls of e-platforms in enhancing the motivation of the students while the education process. So, um, all of us know that now we're living um, in the 21st century and uh, now all um, the um, technology is happening in virtual learning environment. So, what is virtual learning environment? So it's a web-based platform for the digital aspects of courses of study, so usually which are within the educational institutions. So what do a virtual uh, learning environment um, provide us with? So it allows participants to be organized into cohorts, groups, and roles. So it helps to present resources, activities, and interactions within a course structure. So it provides for the different stages of assignment, report on, on participation, so, and have some level of integration with other institutional systems. So, the main components of um, virtual learning environment platforms commonly allow, so, um, like curriculum mapping and planning, so content management, learner engagement and administration, communication and collaboration between the students and, for example, the um, uh, teachers' staff, so it also um, allows the real-time communication, so like um, live uh, video conferencing or audio conferencing. So the main um, elements of virtual learning environment can be uh, named. So the course syllabus, administrative information about the course, a notice board for current information about the ongoing courses, self-assignment, support for communication, including like emails, ready discussions, chat rooms, and etc. So links to outside sources and documentation and statistics, which is also required for institutional administration and quality control. So <coughs> why do we choose virtual learning environment? So the key benefits are the flexibility of time and place, coping with increased uh, students' numbers, sharing and reuse of resources, collaborative work, uh, student-centered learning, reducing the administrative burden, and staff development. Um, so here you see how um, it happens in virtual learning environment. And uh, the next one, so we know that e-learning platforms, um, there are a lot of them, but I would like to talk uh, and to concentrate on Moodle. So what's Moodle? So Moodle is designed to help um, educators create online courses with opportunities for rich interaction. 20 seconds. So, um, why Moodle? It's a free open source that could be installed by any individual teacher or school. It's end user friendly, different technologies and add ons. So, it's global community support systems. So, and it helps um, to increase uh, the motivation of the students um, while um, using the 21st century technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yuna. I'm sorry, we exceed the limit of the three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, our next participant, our next speaker, Irshad Sharfudinov, breaking the wall of modern plague. No, no, no. 
if if, if uh, the speaker do not exceed the three minutes, only in, in this case we can ask the question. We could not exceed the limit. Uh, Irshad Sharfudinov, breaking the wall of modern plagium. Please. PhD student at the Department of Microbiology and today I want to talk about antimicrobial drugs. Uh, I think uh, all of you have experience of taking antibiotics and uh, this is something usual for us, you know. Uh, if you feel sick you just go to the drugstore and you buy antibiotic without prescription and uh, that time we don't think about possible consequences. And I say now about what we call antibiotic resistance. This is something that makes bacteria unsusceptible to uh, treatment with antibiotics. And um, what happens uh, if we don't have uh, effective antibiotics? Uh, so uh, in 15th century, for example, uh, bacterium Yersinia pestis caused a black death, uh, which uh, claimed millions of lives. Uh, in 18th century, another plague incident uh, caused a riot in Moscow. And uh, that was a time when uh, getting infection was often equal to going to the heaven. And um, that continued until effective uh, antimicrobial drugs were discovered. Uh, like uh, strept, uh, streptocyte uh, with a fort uh, of uh, Paul Ehrlich and Domak, and uh, in particular penicillin, uh, which uh, uh, is usually associated with the name uh, of Alexander Fleming. Uh, and that was uh, one of the greatest discoveries of 20th century. Uh, but as uh, years passed, uh, newly discovered antibiotics started uh, to uh, develop resistance and uh, they became ineffective against bacteria bacterial infections. And one of mechanisms is a uh, gene exchange between microorganisms. And uh, it continues uh, even today uh, while we uh, urgently need in new classes of antimicrobial drugs. And uh, in uh, our laboratory, we also try to make our contribution to, uh, towards discovery of new effective drugs. And uh, in uh, um, our colleagues uh, from the Institute of Chemistry synthesized us uh, chemical compounds uh, that are called furanons, and um, they, we found that they are quite effective against such bacterium as Staph aureus, which uh, is known as uh, one of the major pathogens in a hospital. So uh, we hope that our discovery will uh, you know, make contribution to the falling the wall of uh, modern infections. Shall thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Rishad. Uh, our next speaker, Abrosimova Galina, breaking the wall of foreign language competences. Please. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sorry. Sorry, um, my name is Galina Broismova, and um, today I would like to tell you about our project devoted to studying foreign languages. So I have named this work Breaking the Wall of Foreign Language Competencies. Well, globalization of the world makes studying foreign languages essential part of professional and personal development. Knowing languages is uh, one of the core competencies of um, and skills that young people will need to thrive in the 21st century. Sporting and cultivating these skills are crucial for their success. 
And here comes our problem. Studying foreign languages in our country may become a challenging task due to our cultural background, our individual characteristics, limited time, and so on. And now I'd like you to pay attention to English proficiency index um, by English first. As we can see, the amount of people in Russia who knows English is dramatically differs from those of European countries. As you work with students of non-language departments, which adds new problems, um, as English being non-major subjects, so they have less time and opportunities to study languages, uh, we see our task in uh, changing the situation with language competencies. We have our strategy of foreign language teaching based on the well-known blended learning technology. Blended learning is an education that combines e-learning uh, with traditional classroom methods. So correct division between traditional learning and e-learning is fundamental aspect of this technology. As teachers, we ask ourselves, what uh, aspects of language do our students need to learn? How might they learn these particular aspects of language? And how can teachers support their learning? So that's why we offer our strategy according to all of these details, which makes studying foreign languages uh, easier, more interesting, motivative, and effective. So we believe that this strategy will succeed because e-learning is a challenge of this century, and it's close to young people as it's up to date. Traditional methods of language teaching are also essential to provide our students with proficient communicative skills. So, our strategy is aimed to support language learners to construct quality, autonomous, technology-mediated, out-of-class learning experience, alongside with face-to-face -face classes to make greater awareness interest and success in language learning. So, thank you for your attention. We have uh, 10 seconds and you will be the first person who could ask a question according to rules. Please, uh, jury, one question uh, for Galina. Uh, could you please uh, briefly describe the uh, novelty of your approach? Okay, so, um, I think it's not the new thing is that what we use when we teach, um, when we work with the students. So if you want, I can um, join you later and explain you later. Okay, so uh, we are... Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Galina. Uh, our next speaker, and I will try to fight with the time. Uh, where is the reset button? Uh -huh, here. Our next speaker is uh, Vavilov Dmitry, uh, breaking the wall of soil macrofauna cost. Please, welcome. Oh, sorry for that. <coughs> Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, actually, the name of my report is The Cost of Soil Destruction. Sorry for that. Mm. <coughs> deforestation. Mm. Deforestation. Something. Deforestation uh, all over the world uh, affects not only the atmosphere. When the native soils is destructed, mm. when the native soils destructed. When the native soil is destructed, uh, I forgot, sorry. You, you can just uh, show no, the no, next no, no. slide. Sorry. Uh, when the, the native soil is uh, destructed, uh, it takes uh, hundreds of years to restore it. Uh, okay. An immense amount of small organisms inhabit the soil. Okay. Mm. According to our data, one tiny earthworm generates 0 0.4 milliwatt of energy every day. If we take one hectare of forest soil, 
these creatures generate a tremendous amount of energy. In our investigation, we try to compare this energy to the most obtainable green energy, the solar electricity. The cost of it at present is about one dollar per watt. So when someone destroys or pollutes or maybe removes a hectare of soil, of forest soil, we could um, lose two megawatt hour of energy every year. Or thus, we can um, say that for a soil, a hectare for a soil costs two million dollars per year. Thus, uh, with this report, we try to make people think before they destroy things that have been created centuries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for a question, please. The jury, the, uh, the rule is the rule. Any question for the speaker? So how we can get the energy from these sources? Sorry, I didn't how catch. we can get energy from these sources? No, uh, uh, in our investigation, we not try to uh, make the way to get the energy of these sources. We try to uh, show that the energy is very important in the ecosystem processes. The ecosystem services that are uh, being uh, uh, produced by soil animals is enormous. It's really important. And if you remove soil, you remove a lot of way, uh, a lot of fla flux of energy from the uh, environment. It's my way. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's. Uh Okay, um, our next speaker is Hismatulian Artur. And he's trying to break the wall of small outlook. Please welcome. Let's go. What if I tell you that YouTube, it's better of you, but uh, not change it in time, without your use of video, of course. That case that I think about uh, Outlook. Cochrane theory of trust. It uh, claims us for about that problem of trust is problem of coherence. Let's suppose that one assumption is true when it's assumption coherent to all other assumptions. If we want to include this assumption, is this system of our assumptions, of our outlook, if this inclusion not required for the rebuild our system, then it, this assumption is true. I think uh, this means us for uh, our life and our uh, visions of the world. I think that uh, puzzle is so complicated and uh, it's so much work for a new l little system of the world to rebuild it itself. And I think that it's uh, done uh, right way. When we, uh, when we choose with uh, two assumptions and we see that these assumptions try to rebuild our system, we choose not f uh, forget, uh, which is forget it. Forget it, it's not happened in my life. No, no, no. And it's kind of uh, cognitive dissonance. Uh, choose we this assumption or not. And I think that uh, it's not the right way and we uh, can eliminate this situation. Let's suppose website that uh, offer you a web of topics and user uh, checked interesting for, uh, topics for him, and our system just uh, built a simple, usual uh, news feed. But with one surprise, a uh, user can see in one day one extending post. Extending post, it posts uh, which topics is uh, not included in our circle of outlook, but linked with it. And 
it's choose of user, extended his mind or not. And I think that it's uh, cool when people with wide outlook, wide uh, world view, uh, find of point of agreement and uh, answer the question of our questions and decision of conflicts. I think that uh, more objecti objectivity. Ten seconds. Uh, more objectivity uh, visions help us. Thank you. Just uh, right in time. Thank you very much, Artur. I will reset our timer. Uh, please take your place. Uh, it's my pleasure to present our next. Artur, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Everything is over. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present the next speaker, our guest from Moscow, from Russia State Geological Prospecting University, uh, Nesterenko Sergei. Thank you very much for coming. Please uh, come here on the stage. Are you ready? Yeah. Uh -huh, let's go. Hello, my name is Sergei Nesterenko. I'm from Russian State Geological Prospecting University, and the theme of my presentation is uh, breaking the wall of layering associated petroleum gas. Uh, one of the most acute problems in the oil and gas sector today is the problem of layering associated petroleum gas. It uh, not only entails economic, ecological, social losses, and uh, uh, risks, but it also becomes even more relevant in the world trend towards to the transition as a, of the economy to transporting uh, economy to a low carbon and energy efficient mode of development. APG is a mixture uh, of hydrocarbons that are dissolved in oil. APG consists of butane, butane methane, propane, ethane, and other expensive demanded substances. But we cannot use them uh, all anyway, because the construction of oil uh, and the gas uh, pipelines is uh, very expensive. Uh, the topic of using and utilization APG is uh, uh, relevant for all oil producing countries. Airships will solve the problem of access to oil and gas platforms. Uh, they need only a mooring mass that can be easily built. Uh, the next advantage is the safety and reliability of airships. Uh, the third plus is the cheapness of transportation, especially of a large sized large sized cargo. The fourth plus is opportunity of airships uh, of flying for a long time at for long distances between APG uh, APG uh, relate processing plants and uh, uh, oil and gas platforms. The C plus is a large uh, payload to transport the necessary heavy equipment that is uh, often used in oil and gas and industry. I know that uh, there are no such uh, big airships now, but uh, this is a big problem, a I mean APG, uh, and uh, we must solve it, and uh, this is my solution. Thanks. Thank you, but we have uh, Any questions? a little time for questions, please. The jury uh, can ask a question. Oh, Mikhail again. Yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, my question is, so which else uh, solutions you can, we can use instead of your solution and why your solution is better than ours? Uh, I said uh, uh, f five pluses uh, for airships, but uh, maybe uh, we can build more cheap uh, pipelines, uh, ga gas pipelines, or uh, use a special... Uh, mm, Separates for separators for gas, and uh, maybe this is the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sergey. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you uh, for coming. 
Our next speaker uh, is Gnatyuk Natalia. It's uh, not the first time that Natalia uh, is a, a speaker at, at our events. Uh, it was the first time at the Night of Science, maybe a year ago. Uh, but it was in Russian, now it's time to speak in English. Uh, so uh, she's trying to break the wall of fairy tales. Please. Yeah, no. I can't this, uh -huh. Let's reset uh, the, the timer. Okay. <coughs> okay, hello. Uh, today we are going to speak about fairy tales in modern culture. Uh, we based our research on three literary works. Uh, so we have Cinder by Marisa Mayer, uh, The Land of Stories Wishing Spell by Chris Colfer, uh, The Big Over Easy by Jasper Ford. Also, we've taken Maleficent uh, by Robert Stromberg and Into the Woods by Rob Marshall. Uh, we've chosen these works because in them we can see all variations of using fairy tales, um, and they are divided into two groups. Uh, the first group on the left is based on one fairy tale, the other group is based on several tales, and here we have some differences. Uh, when the story is based on one tale, uh, the author pays more attention to character, uh, not to, to the story itself. And these works often represent the uh, other view to the very same story. For example, in Maleficent, we can see the story of Sleeping Beauty told from the point of view of the main villain. Uh, when the story is based on several tales, the author often creates his own world where fairy tale characters live. This type of works does not show every character's motivation, but uh, the author can focus on one group of characters uh, and tell the story in details. As example, here we have the land of stories, where action takes place uh, in other dimension, where all fairy tale stories happened and all heroes still live. Um, in the first novel, Wishing Spell, author focuses on Evil Queen's story. In the second novel, we can learn more about Sleeping Beauty and so on. Uh, the other important tendency we must speak of is gender mixing. Among these five works, we have at least two novels who deal with the problem of gender. Uh, they are The Big Over Easy, uh, which represents the mixture of fairy tale and detective story, and Cinder, where we can find not only fairy tale, but also cyberpunk traits. Uh, the main difference between these two works uh, lays in approach to the gender mixture. Uh, Jasper Ford, in his novel, creates the world where all characters live like ordinary people and writes a detective story which is not uh, connected with any fairy tale. Uh, Marissa Mayer in Cinder creates cyberpunk world with robots, cyborgs, and so on, and with very well-known problems, and rewrites a fairy tale according to the rules of this world. Um, finally, we must speak about all other tendencies we've discovered. Uh, nowadays, works based on fairy tales show more interest in characters and their background than uh, in the story itself. Uh, authors are more interested in villains, as we see Maleficent is very popular, um, uh, and tend to tell the story from their point of view. Uh, the Disney movies, time, time, old time. ones, uh, still have strong influence on the genre, even in literature. Authors often consider the versions of the story, not the original one. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, that's the last sentence, <laughs> there is a strong tendency of mixing fairy tales with other genres in order to find interesting interpretations. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Natalia. I'm sorry we don't have time for a question. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Josh Mandik. He is uh, originally from uh, Belarus, but he's a student of uh, Kazan Federal University. And he's trying to break the wall of tooth decay. Uh, I will stop this and reset. Hey, Are you ready? Let's go. Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Josh uh, Isamisis, and I'm really tired of brushing my teeth. You know, sometimes it's just uh, crazy and you have tooth decay and spend some dollars to, to your dentist. So we're developing a toothbrush that's actually brushing all of your teeth at the same time and we're reading of the, uh, human, from the human factor. Uh, so can you imagine little kids, right? They running around, they not always uh, love to uh, brush their teeth. And even if they do, uh, how do you check? 
did they uh, did a good job or not really and also us like after a tiring day we are uh, going to uh, b before the bed we're going to the bathroom and like oh let's brush the te teeth and miss uh, hurry up missed all the difficult to get uh, spots and develop a disease uh, then going to the dentist and paying some dollar which is not really good and also can you imagine people who actually with disabilities that are uh, um, really waiting for someone to take care uh, with that problem because the carer she have a lot of uh, other stuff to do um, but we all know uh, mechanical vibration like in uh, oral B then there is an Ultra, um, ultrasound uh, toothbrushes that have been developed uh, in 90s and it's been approved by FDA in 92. It's safe. Uh, also, it's clear trend in a world that you, you have to decrease amount of time uh, spend it on toothbrush. So Italian company, uh, they created a toothbrush with few heads. So you brush your teeth from other, of different sides. American company, Blizzident, they uh, created a hairy uh, mouse guard, which you have to choose. I'm not sure if that is effective, but also there is American uh, company called Amabrush. Last year, they uh, ran a successful campaign on Kickstarter, $3.5 million uh, in, in one month. That shows clear um, interest from the public. What our solution is, we actually combining mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, vibration to get rid of the big chunks of food, and then we combine it with ultrasonic um, cavitation to get uh, your between teeth uh, places really uh, clean. And as we all know, uh, as we all know, uh, it's quite simple to actually smile. So I really want to ask you to smile more often because uh, such a simple thing that makes the uh, world a better place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, George, for such a brilliant presentation. Question, please. Who is the main target, Who is the main target of your project? Uh, it's uh, actually women, uh, mothers, who uh, you know, uh, at the home, mothers are taking care, they buy a toothpaste, they buy a toothbrush for the hu husbands, they actually, uh, you know, in the morning, they are in a rush, and uh, with little kids, for example, you have to take uh, care about everything. So mother is a, a target audience, what we're looking for. But also there is uh, other uh, people, <laughs> you know, all of us. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you very much uh, for the answer. Okay, uh, we have uh, two more presentation, uh, and I proudly welcome Gruzev Alexey, and he's trying to break breaking the wall of unseen world. And Alexey is from Nizhny Novgorod. He is our guest. Please welcome. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, according to the World Health Association, about 3.5% of the world's population suffer from all kinds of visual impairment. Compromised vision results in multiple limitations that degrade the quality of people's lives, which in its turn makes people directionally challenged and unconfident when moving in space. It is quite possible to significantly reduce the safety impact on people's lives by using special purpose devices that promote better special awareness. Therefore, in order to solve this challenge, uh, we have to develop such uh, special purpose devices. Our project aims at finding the best solution to the task. The uh, operational principle of our device is based on development of an additional channel that would transmit information about surrounding obstacles to the human brain. The sensor, located on the uh, person's hand, receives, processes and generates a signal that is transmitted to the human brain through electrical stimuli on his tongue. By analyzing these signals, a person is able to respond to changes in the environment. 
uh, this device has a number of advantages in comparison with similar ones. Uh, for example, a high level of signal details that allows for more accurate detection of obstacles. Besides that, the device allows to use an additional method for detecting of obstacles, which is considered supplemental to the already existing ones, such as earring, for example. Relative simplicity and low cost this device make it more attractive and affordable. By the end of this year, we are planning to, to complete all technical tests of the prototype and prepare it for practical testing. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Alexey. We have time for, uh, for questions, please. The jury board, anyone? Mikhail, please. Okay, thank you. Very interesting device. And uh, what can affect on it? For example, magnetic fields or, I don't know, water, Ultras rain? Ultrasonic. No, I mean, uh, what can affect uh, badly? I mean, for example, the signal cannot be achieved by the person if something is around. We, uh, we don't know about uh, medical researching. But we uh, know that uh, have uh, scientists have uh, clinical research, and it's uh, not bad affection. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alexey. Thank you for coming. Uh, and our last presentation is from uh, Kazan Federal University. Uh, Zuiva Yekaterina is trying to break the wall of cinema and literature. Please, welcome. Uh, and I will reset. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go. So, I will talk about arts. And you know that cinema and literature, they are two distinct but equally extraordinary work of arts. Both these arts have certain connections and differences but both have a similarity of taking its readers or audience to a different world. Of course, literature has been a way of artistic expression for the centuries. Writers have told tales about gods, goddesses, heroes, or what, any other characters. Cinema is by far doing the same uh, things uh, right now. And uh, the creation of cinema has brought new considerations, as well as new techniques and approaches of the literary text. Films have been, have been greatly influenced by literature, and of course, if we are talking about different types of adaptations and adaptations of classics, because classics provide cinema with ready-made, protested material, especially successful classics. And cinema is considered, of course, to be a visual and uh, oral narrative and adapting a novel there is translated words into a succession of moving pictures or telling a story. And the question about adaptation is not the degree to which film is faithful to its literary reference, but the possibilities offered by cinema to treat a literary work. Of course, uh, both cinema and novels have the narrative in common, even though story, if stories may be told differently. And of course, films has had a great influence on modern writers. Several novelists adopted cinematic techniques and their aesthetic and their narratives, for example, uh, by the wild usage of cinema, the type of narration change and the traditional perception of time and space change, thanks also to the cinematic methods. And uh, in the second half of the 20th century appeared a new type of cinema and literature interaction, which is called novelization. Now, not the literary text is transformed to a cinematic one, but the cinematic text is transferred to a literary one. So, first of all, it is done for sure for commercial purposes, because to get some income from the usage of rather well-known images and stories, but then, nowadays, a lot of writers use novelization techniques in their stories, for example, and of course, they face a lot of problems because sometimes it's connected with enlargement of the text volume because normally the scenery itself is rather short and the novel is rather big, but still, and still the main problem they feel is like the low prestige of novelization writers, as I'm telling you, because it is still considered to be not high, not high literature, but still nowadays 
situation changes and therefore it is a rather interesting process that we are facing right now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ekaterina, but we have uh, 10 seconds for a question, please, from the jury. Uh -huh. What do you think about the biggest market now in the world, the big market of the comics? Yes, and novelization of the graphic novels is also very popular, and I think the graphic novels are one of the main sources for this uh, market of interaction of literature and cinema, though graphic novels are considered nowadays to be part of the literature also. That's why in first screen ad most popular screen adaptations are adaptations of these comics and therefore the novelization also of this ver it's a long process. First comics, then film, then novelization. So it is very big market nowadays which is highly, highly I think developing, strongly developing. Okay, uh, we are back. Uh, so the jury member uh, already made a decision about the winner uh, and we have uh, the second and the third place. But before we announced all the winners, uh, I want to invite here our winner of the last year, uh, Emil, uh, to say a few words uh, for the all participant and maybe some suggestions. Uh, what's doing there in Berlin? Emil, please. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, all of you guys. I had a really great pleasure being here today. We had so many wonderful projects. All projects are worth winning. That's what we had today. And I wish all of you could go to Berlin, but there will be only one winner and only one first place. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the announcing the third place, I want to one here, Liv Himnobushkanets, uh, professor, the Institute of International Relations, please. The third place goes to Alexey Gruzdev and his project Unseen World. Well, <laughs> I'm so glad because I have my own spectacles. <laughs> my congratulations. Thank you very much and congratulations. And for announcing the second place, I invite here Dilbar Sultanova, please. So, Sharifuddin of Irshad has been awarded se second place. <laughs> and I'd like to wish him to finish his great research and commercialize his research. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and for announcing the winner, I want to invite here Professor, Vice Rector for Educational Activities, Dmitry Abetovich-Tayurski, and he wants to say some for all participants. Thank you very much. So, good evening, everybody. So, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very glad that for the second time the Kazan University can serve like the building where we have the panel discussion, the panel presentation of the project for the breakthrough of the walls. So it's a great pleasure for the university and the great pleasure for the students to be here. And I hope that everybody enjoyed today's session and everybody got a lot of new knowledge, new friends and new competences during the preparation for this uh, event. But I'm a little bit nervous because I have to announce the first prize. The first prize goes to Manjik Yagor. The breaking for the breaking the wall of the tooth decay. I hope he has a very good tooth. That's why he is winner. Thank you. Uh, and all other participants, please come here to receive the certificates and Mikhail, uh, I want to invite you for a ceremony for other participants. Uh, I will announce them. Uh, Vavilov Dmitri, please welcome. And make, make, make a photo, please. Uh, and. Uh, the next certificate, uh, Hismatulin Artur, please. 
and uh, a small uh, present from our from our university. The next is uh, Gnatyuk Natalia. Natalia, please. And the next is going to Nisterenko Sergey, our guest from Moscow. Uh, Arsenio Yulia. Our first speaker. Um, Mustiko Victoria is out. Oh, Zuyevo Ekaterina was the first, now the last. Okay. Abrosimova Galina. Congratulations. 